About a month ago, some of you might remember, the Catholic bishops and their lackeys in Congress were pitching a fit because the Catholic Charities had been denied a grant, an anti-trafficking grant, from the Department of Health and Human Services. They were denied the grant because they don't offer referrals to, quote-unquote, the full range of reproductive services. But that preference for groups to provide those referrals wasn't part of the official rating system. In fact, this preference didn't come about until there was a lawsuit from the ACLU about all this stuff. Um, so they didn't readjust the rating system. They just let everybody know that there was a strong preference for groups that were going to offer referrals to these reproductive health services. So the Catholic Charities were rated an 89, and that was higher than some of the other groups, two of the other groups, but they still didn't get the grant because they don't offer these referrals, and the other groups do. And the bishops and their lackeys are complaining that this is all evidence of anti-Catholic bias. And a, a hearing was held in the Oversight Committee to investigate the extent of this uh, anti-Catholic bias. And I watched that hearing. It was about three hours long. It was really, really uh, something else. And the people that spoke at the hearing, it generally fell along party lines. The Democrats were pro-choice and the Republicans were pro-life. The Democrats are very wishy-washy about the whole thing, and I wasn't happy with their wishy-washiness. It was such a it was such a weak defense, in my opinion. So anyway, I pulled out some of the most annoying bits. It's the mostly it's the pro-lifers and the stuff that they were saying. It's stuff that I pulled out of the first two hours, and then I just sort of gave up. So I've got it all cut up, and it's not necessarily in order of the the way that the people appeared. But anyway, here we go. You know very well from working with victims of human trafficking, they often fall right back into it again. They're identified, then they're repeats, and they steal them off to other cities, and you have all kinds of issues and care for that. So at times, you're taking a victim of human trafficking who's now pregnant, get them an abortion, they can immediately be snatched back up, taken to another city, and you've just put them right back in that situation again. So to, to say, if, if a person is raped in a human trafficking situation, the best thing we can do is get them to an abortion, and so the possibility of them get right back on the street, and if you don't do that, we won't let you help in any of these areas and walk alongside you in this, to me is a very strange mark. You can help in all six of the comprehensive areas, but if you don't do abortions, specifically not just allow them, but promote them. If you don't promote abortions, then we won't let you help. That's the concern here. So just in case you didn't catch it, you probably did, but just in case you didn't catch it, that guy said that being pregnant will somehow protect you from sexual exploitation and sex trafficking and things of that nature. It just sort of provides you a, a protective force field, I guess, of sorts. And it's also interesting how he corrects himself from saying offering services to promoting abortion. Yes, it's all about the promotion. Did the Catholic bishops receive previous grants? Catholic bishops have been receiving grants from the Department of HHS for a long period. I mean specifically with respect to human trafficking. Did yes, they receive they, a five-year contract immediately preceding this? They received a contract, uh, I believe, in the year 2006. Was reproductive health not an issue then? Uh, I was not here then, uh, nor was this administration here then. There are 200 some odd gynecological services that are included. Did you ask the Catholic bishops what percentage of those 200 they were willing to perform? No, we asked them if they were willing to refer, not perform, refer uh, to uh, entities that would provide the full range of gynecological services. Right. And of the 200, how many were they willing to refer? They did not indicate in their application or in my request back to them for clarification. Because the truth be told, if the Catholic bishops had scored a 100, you still wouldn't have picked them. That is not necessarily accurate. Well, would you have? If they'd scored a 100, is an 89 not enough? Well, I was dealing with the facts in front of me. Not okay, a, well, I, I, assume this fact then. If they'd scored a 95, would that have been high enough? I, I cannot, without looking at the facts, the other applicants... Uh, I cannot uh, respond to a hypothetical. Okay, well then tell me what they should have done to get the contract. 
Catholic. Other than score, other than score the second highest score, be recommended by your own people and perform well previously. What else should they have done? Did you consider giving them a human trafficking grant for only male victims? I did not. Did you consider giving them a human trafficking grant for only labor uh, trafficking victims where there was not sexual abuse? We did not. Okay, that guy was a combative asshole with a combative asshole's hairstyle. And I think it's interesting at the end there where he says, uh, did you consider giving a trafficking grant to people that were just labor trafficked, as if people that are labor trafficked don't have a need for any sort of reproductive health services? Mr. Chairman, a little over a decade ago, I authored the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, the landmark law that created America's comprehensive policy to combat modern-day slavery. My legislation established the Health and Human Services Grants Program under review today. For over a decade, we have achieved an amazing left-right, religious, secular, bicameral, bipartisan consensus unified in combating sex and labor trafficking at home and worldwide without promoting abortion until today. It could only be described as an unconscionable abuse of power. The Obama administration has engaged in what amounts to bid rigging. The Obama administration's discriminatory practice of funding NGOs that provide or refer for abortions, even when they fail to win a competitive process, is not only unjust, unethical, and in violation of conscience laws, but it severely, it will severely undermine public and congressional confidence and support for what is otherwise a laudable program. If you are a Catholic or other faith-based NGO or a secular organization of conscience, there is now clear proof that your grant application will not be considered, and Darrell, I said the chairman got to this in this question, under a fair, impartial, and totally transparent process by the Obama administration. The Obama administration's bias against Catholics is an affront to religious freedom and a threat to all people. If the Catholic organization was discriminated against solely because it fundamentally respects the innate value and dignity and preciousness of an unborn child and refuses to be complicit in procuring his or her violent death by abortion. The bottom line is this. Pro-abortion favoritism embedded in this egregiously flawed process does a grave disservice to the victims of trafficking. Victims deserve better. The women and children who have been exploited by modern-day slavery need our help, and that's why I wrote the law in the first place. Okay, so that was Chris Smith. He's all pissed off, as you can tell. Um, and you see, you have to understand a few things to really get the irony of his whole statement and really of this whole deal. Um, because back in the day, there was actually another bill. I think it was from it was uh, sponsored by or authored by Paul Wellstone, and it was more focused on the labor trafficking, and it had a new, more nuanced view of the sex trafficking stuff, and considered some prostitution. You know, like it, it differentiated between the forced prostitution and the non-forced prostitution. So Christopher Smith wrote a bill about trafficking, which put a lot of focus on the sex trafficking stuff. And there was all sorts of allegations of pro-prostitution and whatnot. And uh, the more conservative bill, the bill that was backed by the evangelicals and the feminists, was the one that got passed. The one that they've been using for 10 years to do all this stuff without, quote-unquote, promoting abortion. <laughs> the whole thing pisses me off because you can read about how a whole bunch of uh, feminist leaders sent letters, you know, supporting the more conservative bill, specifically on this, on this issue of prostitution, you know, and because of the issue of prostitution. And they insisted that the, the bill not differentiate between forced prostitution and non-forced prostitution. You know, and you talk about unholy alliances, and it was it was a big time unholy alliance, and a, or alliance of convenience, or whatever you want to call it. It was just, you know, you get your Salvation Army types, your prison fellowship, it was a Colson, those folks, along with the feminists, everybody agreeing, you know, happy joy, kumbaya. And and look at it now, look at it now. There's been ten years worth of victims trafficking victims, you know, no matter what your definition might be. 
They say they got victims. All of them shit out of luck when it comes to the full range of reproductive health services. You know, and I haven't heard the feminists, those feminists who were so in support of this bill to begin with, complaining about any of this stuff. It's If you ask me, they threw all of those people under the bus. Not just prostitutes because of their little, you know, supporting one bill over the other, but also any actual victims. Threw them under the bus. You know, threw them to the conservatives that, you know, it's just, it, the fucking hypocrisy blows my mind. Anyway, moving on. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, I pastored churches and, in fact, dealt with women victims in situations like this myself. My daughter deals with victims in similar situations in Kampala, Uganda, in a third world country, with victims all around. I just love the way he says, I dealt with. I dealt with women before, and my daughter deals with people in Uganda. Oh, yeah, I bet, I bet she does. I find it very discouraging, frustrating, and saddening to sit here in a first world country, a nation that um, vested itself with the responsibility of, of leading the world in freedom and democracy and safety and security. Okay. Now, the phrase comes to mind, the saying, the quote, the whatever the fuck you want to call it comes to mind, that um, those who would sacrifice freedom for security deserve neither. Is that how it goes? A nation built on Judeo-Christian values. Mm -hmm. Values that indeed saw victimization as wrong. Absolutely wrong. <laughs> yeah. And unacceptable. Sure it did. Including the most innocent victim. Victim that had no choice. Victim that has become a product of victimization. And that's the unborn child as well. Yes. You've got an amazing responsibility. But a responsibility, I think, that at present is neglecting to consider the further victimization that goes on. And there will be arguments about that, but there are huge tomes of evidence showing that further victimization of a woman, in this case, in human trafficking, to have a child victimized as well, adds to that victimization in the future. Okay, yeah, don't be confused. He wasn't saying it's, it's going to further victimize her if she has to have a child. No, he's saying it's further victimization if we also victimize the child, the poor little unborn child. And I would love to see some of these tomes of data and research <laughs> that says it's so traumatic particularly in this trafficking situation because I'm pretty sure there hasn't actually been a lot of research on that. And so when I hear that apparently one supplier of assistance to these victims of human trafficking is left out, is cut out of the mix and opportunity to provide ministry to the soul, the body, Every component part of that victim, the woman, the young girl who is put in this heinous situation, and yet we forget about further victimization of her and the victimization of a little unborn. That's a concern to me as well. I just, I just am so repulsed by the way he says, little unborn, <laughs> little unborn, ugh. <laughs> Okay, and up next is a lady Republican pro-lifer who is very, very concerned about things. Uh, I am co-chair of uh, Human Trafficking Committee for the Women's Caucus, so this is an issue that's very near and dear to me. I've also, I'm also a healthcare professional and spent many years in the d domestic violence arena, so what we're talking about here today really, for me, is about the dignity of the woman and the victim. I can't help but wonder how she defines dignity. And I have to say, Mr. Sheldon, that I think what concerns me most are your opening comments and some of the things you said with regards to this issue. Now, 
we've agreed in both sides of the aisle, and you've testified that a lot of these young women and these victims are ages 12, 14. And so we're now going to ask them to make decisions that are, that's going to compound, and, and my colleague mentioned, compound the trauma. Life-changing decisions. They have no idea. They've been traumatized. They're young. They're not competent to make that, those kinds of decisions. And yet you're only offering them, given what's happened here and who's gotten these grants, you're only offering them one, one round of choices, and that's that abortion is probably the best choice to deal with your problem. And that's not fair to that woman because we don't know, um, and, and I would say you don't know, the trauma of abortion and my colleague mentioned it already, may only add to, to what she ha the victimization of what she's gone through. She's almost as bad as the first guy, where he's like, hey, if you're pregnant, you're going to be protected from being you know, a victim or something. And she's like, oh, it's terrible, you know. It's a terrible, life-changing, life-altering event if you're 12 or 13 and you get an abortion, as opposed to the option. <laughs> Like, the option isn't traumatic and life-altering. Non-directive counseling does not mean that you provide counseling which supports abortion. The question is whether you're willing to lay out for that individual what options they have available. Uh, in the case of the Catholic bishops, there was an unwillingness to provide this option. And that's like the 50th time he said basically that same thing to these people. And next is Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's a Democrat. And uh, I have her little clip here because she said something interesting. Well, at the end of the part that I have here. And uh, yeah, she's going to be the last clip too. So let's listen to her. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I couldn't agree, disagree more with the gentle lady. <laughs> this is a hearing about public money. Um, public money in our country comes from people with many different backgrounds and many different views. With the they come particularly, no, I am going to continue. They come continually from people with many different religious views. I don't see how Congress can be concerned with any but two issues. Were the procedures followed, and are we paying attention first and foremost to the victims? So let me go through the processes to see whether any of the procedures were violated. Because the majority had suggested that, that HHS failed to follow its procedures. The only thing I find in the act is the prohibition on organizations that support the legalization of prostitution, and no one has raised that as an issue here, and so I don't think the statute as such can be said to have been violated. Yeah, I love how she points out that the only thing that's really actually prohibited, the only thing that means you can't get any grant money, is if you believe in or you uh, argue for or you support the legalization and or decriminalization of prostitution. I think that's really interesting that she put that in her statement. And that is it. That's all I got. So thanks for listening. Talk to you all later. Bye.